Okay, can folks hear me? Yep. Um, thank you so much, Diana, for the introductions, and also thanks to the Center for the Study of World Religions and the Pluralism Project for co-hosting this panel this evening. It's really just wonderful to have a group of people together to talk about this, and because so much of the book was put together in virtual space, it's really nice to actually share some real space to have a chance to talk about it together. Um, I want to do three things in my 10 minutes. The um, main uh, bulk of my time I'll spend talking a little bit about how we put this together and why we put it together the way we did. I want to just make a few comments about some of the ways we imagine folks might use the book. And I want to close just by thinking a little bit about also the limits of the book, what it doesn't do and what that suggests about maybe what we all might be engaged with next, the work that remains. We started this book in the wake of a conference that Circle hosted on the campuses of Andover Newton and Hebrew College. As Orr and I were beginning the work co-directing the center, we realized that we didn't have very many models for what it was we thought we were supposed to be doing, and that maybe one of the um, best ways we could start was by inviting a whole group of educators and activists and religious leaders to our campus to talk about what they were doing, what, they, what the models were that were out there, what the needs were that they were seeing with their own students as they were thinking about how to educate future religious leaders, specifically in a Jewish, Christian, or Muslim context, um, in ways that would prepare them for the realities of the sort of growing religious pluralism that's part of our uh, communities these days. And that just set off a whole uh, network of conversations and questions um, that really stimulated our thinking about what this work was about. And when the three-day conference was over, we started thinking, you know, you have to do those conference proceedings for your funders and your board members and all. And we thought, how could we make this something really meaningful and not another, another set of white papers or some conference proceedings that sits on a couple shelves. And when we talked about what was most powerful and moving to us out of the conference experience, we just kept coming back again and again to the power of the stories that people were telling. Now, we, we sort of set this up by asking folks coming to the conference not to prepare academic papers, but instead to prepare some firsthand remarks about their lived experiences in the classroom, in their communities, um, what they were seeing, what the needs were, and that really lent itself to this narrative storytelling modality. And in fact, there was this one sort of pin-dropping moment at the conference where Paul Knitter got up and started to talk about what it felt like to be a young student in Rome, a young seminarian, when all these bishops, including a group of American bishops whose Latin was a little rusty, um, we're coming to read something called Vatican II documents in draft form in Latin. So he was helping tr them translate these documents that, and as he was doing these translations, he was realizing this is going to radically reshape this church that I'm vowing my life to. Um, and the, the connection to the religious other was the piece of it that struck him as most significant, that it is now um, sort of a calling of my Catholic faith to be engaged with the religious other. And that really reoriented the shape of his career and his writing and his work. And you could just see everyone in the conference kind of leaning forward as he told the story. And we, out of that, we just thought, you know what? Let's tell some stories. And the first thing we need to do is actually extend the invitation to the conference participants to, to send us stories, but also more broadly, we want to invite folks beyond the Abrahamic traditions to start telling these stories. Because anecdotally, we've all heard, oh, interreligious work is very powerful. It changed the way I think about myself or s others. But the data for that was, is slim. A it remains slim. And we, we felt like, well, one thing we could do is start uh, collecting some of that data. And, and that's really what this book uh, represents the results of that effort. Um, I'm going to leave it to Orr to talk a little more particularly or specifically about the power of story storytelling, but I just wanted to say uh, one thing that I, that I think particularly resonates for me about 
why we focused on the storytelling modality. I actually consider it a part of my inheritance from feminist theology, which is very much rooted in and takes seriously women's experiences of disempowerment and empowerment, and um, prompted uh, Catholic feminist scholar Sandra Schneider to write, storytelling is both a technique for consciousness raising and a source of personal support. And one of my assertions or senses about interfaith work I in general is that at its heart, it really is also consciousness raising work. And that sharing our stories about how it feels to walk around in our own particular religious skin in this 21st century American context as we encounter others with their own distinct religious identity is a very powerful way to help catalyze this consciousness raising which is essential for breaking down the kinds of religious barriers that this book is really all about um, focusing on. So back to the volume. I want to talk a little about how we organized the book. Believe it or not, we did not start with this beautiful seven-part structure in our heads and then fill the stories in. Um, and in fact, there was a point mid-summer when our publishing deadline was looming that I actually suggested to our editor that maybe the best way to organize these stories was alphabetically by the author's last name. Well, wisely, our editor suggested that perhaps there was a better way to organize it, and maybe he could give us an extra week if we really needed the time. So Greg Mobley and Orr Rose and I sequestered ourselves in a conference room with a pile of 53 irreducible, remarkable, individual stories and thought, what in heaven's name do we do with these now? We all agreed that we could do better than alphabetical order. And we all agreed that we didn't want to lock each story into neat sections with their own religious kin, so to speak. We decided we had a shared sense that that would reinforce some of the lines that we were really trying to rethink. But beyond that, there was very little that we did agree on. So what we did, and I'm really happy about what we did, and it may have been more out of desperation than any great wisdom on our part, was to let the stories lead us into the structure of the book. And the way we did that was really simple. We, we literally held up each story in turn and said things like, this story really speaks to what happens when you first realize your own religious perspective is not the only one in the world. Or, this story makes me think about what it means to rethink your own religious identity because of a conversation or an encounter you've had with someone who is different than you. And then we started saying things like, well, this story reminds me of that one you just talked about, and maybe these two go together somehow. And slowly but surely, with like great passion and uh, energy, <laughs> we all defended the places where we thought these particular stories belonged, and we let, the, we let that emerging um, order suggest the different categories that ended up being the structure of the book. Um, and that was a very creative process, and it really helped, I think, all of us understand more about the nature of interreligious encounters than we did when we started this project. So that was, that was fun and, and very instructive, and I think, um, one way to read the book is to really look at each part as a, as a sort of virtual neighborhood and think about what is this particular neighborhood telling us about the texture or the territory or the contours of, um, of this the set of themes that we're dealing with in a particular section. Um, now, I'm not going to go through every one of these sections because I would encourage you to buy the book and do that yourselves. How's that for a plug? Um, but um, maybe that's something that we can come back to as we hear about some of the individual stories and think about some of the questions that you all have. So rather than spending more time on the book, how much time do I have here? About a minute. <laughs> I'm very quickly going to say a few things about how to use the book and then uh, some of the limits. So. Just a few stories about some different contexts. Today, somebody walked up to me on the sidewalk at Andover Newton and said, my church just used your book in an adult Sunday school series where our theme was, who is my neighbor? And I was like, ooh, that's a great illustration for the talk I have to give tonight. <laughs> Today, as well, I am not making this stuff up. 
in my email inbox, I have a friend who is a Muslim chaplain on a college campus, and she wrote to me and said, I see that you are speaking on a panel tonight. I'm sorry I can't be there, but I want to let you know that I'm reading your book, and it's very moving and inspiring to me. So there's a personal engagement with the text, just on her own, in bits and pieces, she's reading the book. Um, a third example, next month in my Daughters of Abraham book group that Diana mentioned, which is a group for Muslim, Christian, and um, Jewish women that was actually founded by my mother-in-law, Edie Howe, uh, we're going to be reading My Neighbor's Faith as the book club <coughs> selection. And then just a final example, it's also a book that we hope can be used in various classroom settings in various ways. I'm teaching a class or taking a group this summer to Israel and Palestine, and one thing we want to help students think about is how does their narrative intersect with, relate to the narratives they're going to hear on this trip? How do they put themselves into this story? Um, and where do the stories differ? And what do they, where do they go from there? So that's another use that I'm hoping um, might be a possibility, and, and others may have more to say about that. Um, Finally, just one note about what we didn't do in this book. Um, Frank Clooney may mention more of this, but he wrote a review of the book for the BTI magazine. And one of the points that he made that I really appreciated was, however lovely or transformative or interesting the set of stories are, stories do not a curriculum make. So I think the task that remains for us is to think together creatively, and this is happening in many places, and we can come back to it if we want to, about what does it mean to create a curriculum to develop the kinds of skills, knowledge, experiences, understandings that our future religious leaders need, that we expect of them, given the context that we're all living in, given the demands, given the needs. And that's an open question, but it's one that I hope you'll all engage with us around as we think together about it. All right, so um, I want to say a little bit uh, about my piece in this, uh, in this contribution, I mean in this volume. Uh, uh, when, uh, when I received the invitation to write for this volume, I thought very hard, like what was an interesting moment for me. And I chose um, uh, the moment of coming to the United States as a challenging moment. Uh, where uh, identity was challenged in so many different ways. Um, so a little bit about my background, so you'll understand then what the challenges were. Um, so I grew up in, um, uh, in Kenya, in East Africa, uh, uh, obviously in a family of South Asian ancestry, but my family has been there in uh, Kenya for at least from my mother's side, for over 200 years. Um, so, so we have deep roots there. And of course, nationalism and the creation of Kenya and all of that started changing identity. Also, I lived <coughs> in a society that, at least when I was growing up, was under British colonial rule. Uh, and it was a society where the idiom of colonial rule was racial. So the society was divided very strongly on racial grounds. Um, and uh, based on your race, there was certain occupations, certain kind of schools you could go to, certain, there were opportunities, economic opportunities, and so on. And it was a kind of a, um, I think, a tripartite society where we talked about Europeans, and Europeans meant all the white people uh, who had the best schools, the best hospitals, the best opportunities. And then you had a second category, the Asians. And Asians in East Africa uh, meant actually people from, of South Asian origin, um, who were basically, uh, again, had, you know, were, uh, some of them were involved in trade, uh, the, some of the professions, but the kinds of schools and things you went to, you know, you had less resources. Sometimes these communities developed their own schools. And then you had, this third group the c just uh, lumped together as the Africans. Mm -hmm. And the Africans were just uh, all the different tribes who all spoke different languages, different ethnicities and groups and so on. So this is the kind, and you very rarely actually encountered people. Mm -hmm. 
uh, especially with, uh, I remember the, um, in some of the schools after I was, um, uh, at some point during my childhood, Kenya became independent. So um, some of this started breaking down when this government nationalized schools. So that they try to integrate schools. So at least the Asian category and the African category were mixed a little bit, but the European category still remained separate because they went to elite schools and so on. So this was the kind of environment that I grew up. I also grew up within this category Asian, or South Asian, I should you know say. There were many subgroups. There were different Muslim groups, Shia, Sunni, and so on. But there were also many um, uh, Hindu groups, and Sikhs, and Jains, and all kinds of really the sort of a cross-section of the whole, all the religious traditions of South Asia were represented there. So we encountered, so we knew it. But because we were all very, uh, because we were all minorities, we, we engaged, so we knew each other was different, but there was a kind of solidarity mm. that the religious difference wasn't that big an issue. You interacted with each other and so on. In any case, uh, and so within that subgroup, I belong to the uh, Ismaili group, which is a subsect of the Shia. And each of these groups, uh, you know, is also very, really well organized, so they have their own uh, uh, social structures, worship spaces, schools, hospitals, and so on. So at a certain level, you're, you're working within one group, but you're also interacting with other groups. Uh, in any case, so that was the kind of environment I grew up in. Then I come to the United States as a freshman, uh, uh, Harvard. I hadn't, I had never left Kenya before. This was my first trip out of Africa. And I come here, and there were some interesting questions that started arising. So one of the f uh, questions, I, uh, I think the first or the second day that I was here, uh, in the freshman union, which is now the Barker, which, which is now the Barker Center, but it was the freshman dining hall. Uh, I went in there to have a meal, um, and of course everybody is asking everybody else, you know, where are you from, what do you do, uh, what are your SAT scores, you know, all <laughs> these kind of things, you know, they're asking. So anyway, so I told, uh, I remember the first person we had, so I told someone I was from Africa. And I was told, no, you can't be from Africa. You don't look African. And I said, well, but Africa is my home. I mean, I don't know any other home. <laughs> so, but there was this cat, you know, I just found it all of a sudden. So then I started explaining people, okay, this is I come from Kenya, this is how the structure is in Kenya. And I belong to this category, Asian, in Kenya. Oh, you can't be Asian. Because Asian, of course, in the United States means. So I think that the category African, the category Asian, were all became problematic. Um, and then I, f uh, uh, so while I was a, f a freshman, I started studying Arabic. And, um, uh, and so I was in this intensive course that met 10 hours a week, so it was like two, like doing one whole year in one semester. And we had a visiting professor from Lebanon. And um, he, was, he was a very good teacher. Uh, but because it was an intensive class, it was very small. Uh, so everybody knew everybody else. And um, I should also remark on the, on the side that that group of people who were in that Arabic class all ended up becoming quite prominent scholars in Arabic literature and so on and so forth. So that was another interesting self-selecting group. But in any case, I remember during one of the classes, and I don't know what the context was, but this Lebanese professor asked me uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, what, uh, what branch of Islam I belong to. And I told him I was Ismaili. And he was shocked, he was horrified. And he said, he used this phrase in Arabic, uh, that there is no, 
you know, this is a phrase that people seek refuge when they encounter something evil uh, or something really terrible. Um, and obviously he, you know, he said, okay, here's this, you know, for him I was a heretic. And until that time, there was not, this was not even an issue. So this raised some very interesting questions here that you know, I'm, my identity was being challenged at so many different levels. And how do you, uh, where do you place yourself and how do you think about yourself? And um, it's a good thing I was studying religion. I think Diana was one of, one of my first teachers and we start thinking about how religious identity is constructed, how culture plays a role. So I think intellectually I started, I had the tools to understand what was happening but I think those were very formative moments uh, where uh, identity is challenged. Uh, and then you basically have to define who you are for yourself and sometimes creating um, uh, labels and categories that maybe don't make sense to other people but make total sense to you. So I, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a reporter from the Harvard Crimson who was doing a a story on faculty profiles uh, and came to um, interview me and asked me about how do, you, how do you define yourself? And so I said, well, I am an uh, African Asian American. <laughs> yeah, we don't have, but I said those categories make total sense to me. And so this is my identity. Uh, and each of those labels is important. And then I would add to that, who happens to be a smiley Muslim? <laughs> so in any case, I see the sign is uh, that I'm, my time's up. So I'll stop my story and we'll move on. It's such a good yeah. story. Keep going. Okay. I think you can already see why this genius of this book is in the stories. Um, I was thinking as Jenny was describing that moment in the summer when they were trying to figure out what to do with the narrative pieces that everybody had written, um, that I'll just give you one other detail. I don't know that it was anyone else's but mine, and of course they won't tell because we're colleagues. Um, but I think some of us took these pieces that were due in April and actually wrote them who knows when, um, into the middle of the night into June and then discovered word limits that had to be written. Look at her, she's saying this true. And um, later that summer um, would come an email my way um, from Jenny saying, um, Janet, I wonder if you'd want to expand some of these points just a little bit. You know, you're the only person who wrote about interfaith marriage. And I was stunned because I kind of assumed that if there were 20 essays in this book, 10 of them would be about that. Um, and I, I, I have done my own work for long enough to know, certainly not all, but at least some of the reasons why this is a difficult topic. But the reason I wanted to write about it was not so much because it was difficult and continues to challenge many of us who function in some kind of leadership or laity position in religious communities and have to think about those places where the membranes between the communities are or are not permeable, um, where people can in fact actually speak across those lines with regard, as opposed to saying that's impossible, you can't be that. Um, I was sitting here thinking you were 18 years old and people were telling you you weren't who you were. Um, as a chaplain of a university, that horrifies me. That, <laughs> that would be spoken by our faculty, but I know it hasn't stopped. Um, I particularly was uh, honored by the invitation to write this piece because although I couldn't have told you that it was initially going to be about interfaith marriage, I knew it was going to be about a pretty late discovery on my part that the story I thought that was prominent in my religious upbringing and identity formation was actually not the prominent story. Um, so what am I telling you? I'm telling you there are all kinds of threads, I bet, for most of us in this book um, that brought us to study with Diana. Um, if you told me when I signed up for a course called Pilgrimage um, in my years at Harvard Divinity School that 
what really made more sense to me than most of what I heard in that course was the idea that it was a journey um, and that I needed to hear how people had made spiritual journeys and why that idea had not just merit um, but worth. I certainly wasn't making the journey to Benares. I wasn't walking um, the Via Della Rosa. In fact, the people that raised me in a sectarian Christian community would have been horrified to even think about that because it was so Catholic. I thought the story of identity that was most important to me was my father's sectarian folks <coughs> who founded a tiny little community that didn't even take a name in this country until after the Civil War, really during the Civil War, because there was no other way to declare pacifism. The same community that had meant my dad was a conscious objector in World War II when you didn't do that. But that storyline had so organized my thinking about religion and frankly so cut me off from conversation about religion beyond people that I knew that it was absolutely stunning to discover that in 1858 in the marriage annals of Paris, a marriage was recorded between my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother and Mohammed Benayed was marrying Marie Vardetsky. She was a 19-year-old Polish Catholic woman who had graduated with a pretty nice education in French and in music, but was unmarried, God forbid, at 19. So her parents, in the middle of, those of you who know your history, know that 1858 in Paris was no place to be. Um, there were barely rats for dinner, um, and her folks probably needing to unload all of their dependents as best they could sent her to work in a mission school. Mohammed Benayed, her soon-to-be husband, my great-grandfather, was a man whose family w began their lives as nearly as we can understand in Turkey. And he had ended up in the Algerian military and was, in fact, charged with the safety of the school in Algeria where she taught. Um, and my uh, great relatives in that generation are derivative of that marriage. They fled Paris and ended up in Blackpool, where in an incident that I think is probably racial as well as religious. They were burned out after establishing a pretty nice retail business. He's buried in an Anglican cemetery in the center part of England, which is exactly where those Christadelphians emerged, the people that I thought were the normative part of my religious life. On the other side, on my mom's side, come a whole crowd of people with Irish Catholic background, Christian science, my great uh, my father's um, story of my grandfather was that all he wanted was the six kids to go out the door in the morning and come back having sung in church choirs where you were paid a quarter. It was the Depression. Too many children, not enough money. But in fact, my mother's pilgrimage through religious communities was far broader, and she was much less horrified by this story and is actually the person who finally told it, finding some old photographs and then a Facebook connection. And there's lots more I'd be happy to tell you. But what I realized was that in ordination in 1980 in the United Church of Christ, having strayed far from the sectarian beginnings that anybody in my family could easily approve, my brother called my parents when I was starting at Harvard Divinity School. He didn't know that I'd left my public school teaching job. And when the line was a little too quiet when I got on the line, and he said, well, what are you doing these days? And then to fill the space, he said, well, at least you're not in divinity school. Um, <laughs> It, it was sort of a standing joke in our family that of the places anyone would end up that were just about as bad as you could end up, um, it would be something like that. Um, so there, the, the lines and the wrinkles in the story of my own life that were all there to be, could you say, ironed out, it would take a lot of spraying with starch and water and various other things to make them all lay down flat, and they don't. They don't talk to one another. They're not easy. But when in 1983, the story I tell in this book, into my office walked a lovely, very established woman from a congregational heritage that took her all the way back into the 17th century in this country because she'd fallen head over tin cups in love with a Muslim man who'd come to study engineering at Dartmouth. And try as they might to break the relationship up, they just couldn't do it. They kept coming back together. And she showed up in my office in a wonderful church that Diana and I actually have sort of in common, since her aunt and uncle were members of that church, um, to ask if I could possibly imagine 
that there would be a blessing for their marriage. I'd love to sit here and tell you that I waded through that problem elegantly or I thought about it wonderfully. I guess I can only tell you that it was a pilgrimage, that try as I might, even in Calvin's institutes, all I could find was instruction about the ordinances of life by which God ordered and blessed the world. And I came to the conclusion that I wasn't permitted to do this marriage. I was obliged to do it. And I'd love to tell you more about that. And the invitation to write this essay has been an opportunity to think about that. It clearly wasn't up to me to officiate in God's world as though I were in charge of who loved who or who could meet. It was clear to me that universities were causing havoc by inviting people from Africa who are actually Asian, who are Muslim but not the right kind of Muslim, to go and study and turn into all kinds of things that they're not supposed to come in contact with and drink coffee with and fall in love with and do all those things that all of you and we did too. But to be placed in the midst of that incredible pilgrimage with some authorization to reflect prayer, to offer it as it could be constructed by the people with whom you would pray, that was a moment I not only felt empowered to do, but as I've learned this story that I've written about a little, I actually would argue my great grandparents ordained me to do. So. This always breaks me up to talk about it, but in the way that they were not yeah. able to be named dearly beloved by anyone. I find myself wanting for our universities to be able to save a world that's so broken, that it is dearly beloved by a God we can't even articulate or imagine, let alone define in our traditions. So this idea that somehow my version of reality or the dogma of my tradition should somehow limit where it is those of us called to um, serve on behalf of that vision, that we should set up fences or name, strikes me as heresy, maybe even blasphemy. To imagine that we are somehow together in a generation on a journey and able to come together, yes, it's true, it's not a curriculum, but we're working on that. <laughs> but the avoidance of that curriculum is something that has rendered us religiously illiterate in ways that mean these stories cannot even be heard, let alone told. And I don't know that because I went to Harvard or Wellesley or Tufts or because I work at Brown. I know it because of the silence in my own family for generations about a story that to me is so compelling and moving that I literally owe the color of my hair and the color of my eyes to it. So it's a privilege to be part of this collection. And these folks in this book are amazing. Buy the book, it's fun. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be among friends, colleagues, and mentors. With the time that is allotted to me, I want to share a few reflections about the nature of storytelling, of personal narrative in the context of interfaith work. As meaning-seeking creatures, we're all involved in the creation and ongoing editing of stories. We tell these stories to help orient and direct ourselves existentially, morally, and spiritually. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur wrote that, quote, life is an activity and passion in search of a narrative. And the Icelandic thinker Stefan Snevar explains, the self is not a given. It is something that must be created. In fact, we live our lives in and through a variety of stories, connecting personal and interpersonal dimensions, creating complex narrative webs. In all narratives, says Ricoeur, there is both permanence and change, or in his language, concordance and discordance. In many of our traditions, of course, there are a set of master or foundational stories, stories that serve to frame our histories, our liturgies, our calendars, and life cycle. Creation, revelation, redemption are but three of the coded words that carry with them a whole set of deep and complex stories. I think that we need to create a balance between 
living into existing stories, stories that are larger than ourselves, and honoring our own particular journeys, the specific shape and texture of our individual lives. And in so doing, of course, there's a delicate balance that we have to think about. Just as master or foundational stories can be liberating or oppressive, so too can personal stories when used for different ends and means. The great Hasidic master known as the Sfas Emes, a speaker of truth, asks why the book of Genesis is replete with so many stories about human beings. Why spend all of that precious space between the account of creation and the giving of the Torah in the book of Exodus dwelling on the stories of mere mortals, individuals whom we know to be both greatly virtuous and highly problematic? His answer is that stories not only serve as life lessons for us, but also serve to remind us that we must be actively involved in scripting our own lives in partnership with the divine. We must be consciously engaged, he says, in writing our own sacred stories, not only for ourselves, but for others. And he winds down this homiletical reflection by saying, the hope, the prayer is that one day, our stories, like those of the patriarchs and the matriarchs in the book of Genesis, will serve as touchstones, or as Torah, I dare say, in its literal meaning, that being teaching for future generations. In assembling my neighbor's faith, we felt a strong need to gather a robust collection of personal stories by religious leaders at different points along their journeys, working to foster an ethos of religious pluralism. Individuals reaching across religious lines for the sake of mutual learning, growth, and action for the common good. And if that brief description of religious pluralism is familiar to it, it should be since it flows from the work of one Diana Eck. As Jenny mentioned, in assembling this volume, we were keenly aware that regrettably, there is a paucity of real world stories of religious pluralism. And we wanted to contribute to a new and emerging narrative. It was our hope that people would use these stories as sources of learning, conversation, and action. Further, we hope that this collection would inspire readers to reflect on their own beliefs and commitments and share their stories with others in intra and inter-religious contexts. Why stories? It is my experience after a decade or so of working as a rabbi in interreligious context, that there are several reasons why storytelling is a powerful tool. A tool, not the only tool, but a powerful one in the work that we're doing. The first reason is that each person is given the opportunity to introduce herself and not be defined by others, generalizations, stereotypes, and the like. Relatedly, in the sharing of personal stories, one can help to create a more even playing field where each person possesses vital information that only they can disclose. The individual himself, you might say, becomes a canonical source. As our friends at the Interfaith Youth Corps like to say to their participants, no one in the world knows what it is like to be you better than you. My therapist might disagree, but <laughs> we'll leave that for Frank's closing comments. A third reason that I want to make mention of in terms of the power of storytelling in the context of interfaith engagement is that because so many of our traditions, both religious and secular, use storytelling as a tool to engage and stimulate serious thought and reflection, it serves as a natural bridge across traditions. Just think of the ways in which we intuitively moved forward and listen with greater openness 
the way in which we summoned our more receptive selves as both Ali and Janet began to tell their stories. Two more points about the power of storytelling in interfaith contexts. In listening attentively to others tell their stories, we have the ability, if we hone it, to refine our capacity to identify both similarities and differences. This, to me, is crucial in the development of an ethos of religious pluralism, in which we learn to abide the basic tension between similarity and difference and commit ourselves to create healthy, safe, and mutually enriching communities. In fact, through the give and take of story sharing, we have the beginnings of a new community. The last thing that I want to uh, add is that storytelling, of course, in the words of Ricoeur, has elements both of concordance and discordance. It's been my experience as an educator and a participant in such story sharing that we have the opportunity to differentiate between our personal stories and the stories of our larger religious communities. And I think this is very powerful in terms of identity formation and in introducing ourselves to others and the communities that we emerge from and are a part of. In what ways does my experience reflect trends and patterns in Judaism, Christianity, or Islam that are greater than I am? And at the same time, how is my story, that specifically of a 21st century middle class Jewish man living in West Newton? The last point is that when we share our stories, we're reminded of something that I think is difficult because we spend so much time editing and refining and preparing to present in an orderly fashion who we are through our stories. And that's the lesson that we are always in process, that our stories are unfinished. Much as we seek to present cohesive narratives, we're always editing, always forming and being formed by God, by cultural and political movements, by teachers and friends, and by the people with whom we are engaging in the sacred act of storytelling in this very moment. Thank you. My role as a uh, respondent is perhaps superfluous. I think you've heard so many wonderful things already. I would like to preface it, so April, don't start the clock running yet, <laughs> by a, a couple of um, uh, announcements or uh, moments. First of all, I'd just like to say I think it's a wonderful um, <laughs> fact that you may have not noticed entirely that the Pluralism Project and the Center for the Study of World Religions are doing this together. I, mean, I think this is a, a wonderful event. I'm very grateful to Diana and to Whitney and to April who worked so well with Lexi and Morgan and Corey and bringing us together for this event because I think there's a real synergy created and I hope we can continue this across the street at the reception just to celebrate the fact that we, we can work together with the, the riches of these two organizations. And, and secondly, I'd just like to point out that the, this is a, an event early in Interfaith Week at Harvard. Harvard has declared this to be Interfaith Week, which is a really beautiful occasion early in the second semester. There'll be another occasion that we're co-sponsoring on Friday. Uh, this year has been the 150th anniversary of the birth of Swami Vivekananda, mm -hmm. who was at the World Parliament of Religions in 1893, one of the, the early pioneering figures in the interfaith movement, which led to the renewal of the parliament <coughs> in the 90s and, and thereafter. Um, in Harvard Yard, in Seaver Hall, on Friday evening, we'll have a, a panel commemorating and thinking about Vivekananda at 5.30, 5.30 in Seaver Hall in Harvard Yard. And we picked Seaver Hall. Swami Tyagananda and myself talked about this at length because uh, Swami uh, Vivekananda gave a lecture there mm -hmm. um, over 100 years ago. So we're kind of returning to that place, a little pilgrimage even on the Harvard campus. But turning then to the work um, before me to respond, I, th I think I'll say the obvious mainly. Uh, first of all, that th the volume is incredibly powerful. Uh, the stories are meditative, they invite us 
to dwell upon the mystery of each of the individuals involved, uh, the kind of sacramental moments that the, the great abstractions and the great issues about cultures coming together, civilizations meeting, religions crossing paths, are so richly brought together in these stories. It's, it's a wonderful set of events. And we could take another hour just to go through listing all the wonderful of these 53 stories. But I think we could see in, in the very powerful, simple versions um, Ali and Janet gave of, of their stories, is that these stories themselves have a long history that make them possible today. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as Orr was saying, our stories are unfinished. In a sense, they're beginningless as well. Yeah. It wasn't as if the interfaith possibilities only recently became real, but going back hundreds of years in different parts of the world, different continents, people, have, their lives have always been weaving together. And the, the realization that we may have in our identities at this particular moment now is really made possible by our ancestors who've gone before us in our different traditions that crossing boundaries is possible and learning from the other is possible. And I think the way Janet and Ali have brought this out uh, makes so clear uh, what is at stake here and how beautiful it is. But as Jennifer was talking about in her reflection and pointing out the, the, the last minute kind of grammar of the book and coming up with the seven categories, a, a second service that the book does, and I'm very grateful to Greg Mobley and to Orr and to Jennifer for, for thinking this through, is once we have this proliferation of, of stories and these accounts, and we could multiply, I'm sure, with, with everybody in this room, I mean, the stories that have brought us here and the complications of our lives, is that in some way beginning to map the complexity, map the plurality, and put things, not so much in an order that would stifle it, but that we can articulate our memories better um, about these uh, accounts. And the village, the clusters, uh, the kind of thematic currents flowing together that we have. And just to give you the titles, um, and you'll, when you buy the book, you'll see them more clearly. Encountering the neighbor, uh, meeting new neighbors across face lines. Second, viewing home anew, looking back at religious homes from the outside. Redrawing our maps, looking at the boundaries between <coughs> religions that appear on maps, which are not always reliable or useful guides in the field. Unpacking our belongings. Like travelers who inevitably find themselves burdened with cargo, they do not recall having personally loaded. And they let go of it. <laughs> Stepping across the line by way of transformative religious experiences mediated through the practices or among the precincts of a faith foreign to one's own. Or number six, finding fellow travelers by the serendipity of unexpected relationships forged across religious boundaries. And finally, number seven, repairing our shared world when witnesses together offer their testimonies to how their religious commitments compel them to join with others of a different or no religion in common service. And one of the, the beautiful facts of, of the book is that the authors were not, you're invited to contribute to category two, or you're invited to contribute to category six, but hearing the stories and sifting <coughs> through them late at night, meditating on them, these kind of groupings uh, came to the fore. And of course, they're flexible, and, and stories could be moved around to some extent. But I think this is a, a very great need that we have, is once we've recognized the multiplicity of stories, how do we begin to imagine talking about them in coherent pathways? And the book does a great service in helping us to work on that path. As, as Jennifer also admitted um, and pointed to, um, in the review I did for the, the BTI Bulletin, which I, magazine is, which I believe is not out yet, but coming out, um, it, it, any book reviewer, you have to say something new, otherwise they'll say you have no respectability as a, a, a <laughs> professor at Harvard, you have to say something. Um, I was thinking that what, what comes after this book, and I'll talk about this in two ways. One is to say there is kind of room for theological reflection and then reflection on the curriculum. And this is not to say that, okay, now let's put these stories back in their boxes and let's return them back to the things we already know that we can become familiar, but rather the stories raise large questions for us about who are we who claim to be religious students, religious leaders, religious sisters and brothers, who exactly are we when we have these stories that have really no beginning and no end? And what are to we to say to one another um, as colleagues, as friends, as family, but also as teachers and students, as pastors and religious leaders? How do we talk to one another? There are great questions that arise from a book like this about those categories with which we begin of being Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or Native American 
or pagan or any of the other traditions about which we might speak. How do we put these things in, in terms of our identities and the things that we have to say? And I think one of the service of the volumes is that it doesn't simply say this is an alternative to thinking theologically or this is an alternative to having a Korean curriculum, but in some ways it increases the pressure because it says that if you are going to educate in the world in which we live in the 21st century, and if you are going to be you know, deans and administrators and professors and curriculum makers on a campus, on just about any of our campuses, and if you are willing to listen to the students who come through your doors and sit in your classrooms, the pressure is to honor and take into serious account the reality of those complex stories, and then take a look in the mirror and realize that your own story is rather complicated too. And that the pressure is there, do our traditions hold? Do the doctrines still work? Do the stories we told in our great books, not about simply myself or yourself, but ourselves, the traditions, how do those stories still work and how can we make those stories coherent again? So the pressure has been created and the credibility has been called into question, which I think then makes us say we can also find in these stories the wherewithal and the riches to do that. That I don't think this book in any way takes away from the, the beauties and powers of being an Ishmaeli Muslim or being a Sunni Muslim or being a Jew or a Christian or a pagan or Buddhist or Muslim, whatever. All of these categories come to life again, but not kind of in a pristine innocence where they stand over against and excluded from every other reality. But once the interweaving has been seen and noticed, it opens up again the possibility I can, we can tell our story again. In this seminary, we'll tell it this way, not because we're blind and not because we're arrogant, but because we know the complexity of these things, we'll tell it again. And I think there's a great challenge before us not to be afraid of the pluralism, because the pluralism is not kind of an abstraction of the modern world, but it's the myriad multiple stories that we live, that we're living on our campuses, and we just have to not be afraid to recognize that. The final thing I'll say, which also um, had figured in my review, is that there are the, the 53 stories and the seven categories. Uh, could there be more? <laughs> and I would just like to close by recommending two more of these categories and maybe volume two um, that might follow <laughs> can have others. And one is, I'm thinking that most of these stories in their, in their great beauty are stories of people who through personal encounters, through meeting, talking to a friend or meeting a stranger or living in a neighborhood for some time, through the social interaction, begin to realize I can no longer live in my little ivory tower or I, I'm crossing the boundary. It seems to me that there's some space in here for what I call the category of the God sent. That as the missionaries of old who would sort of go from where they are and be sent out into the world unbeknownst of where they're going, there may be individuals that we have to take into account who become interreligiously involved because they feel deep inside their own tradition, their own mystical experience, I must go out and that that category somehow has a place to hold. And the, the patron saint, each of these sections kind of has patron saints, you might say, uh, could on the one hand be Abraham, Abram. And the, the sense that Abram, not in kind of conversation or dialogue with his neighbors, perhaps, who knows, but this figure from the book of Genesis suddenly had this great sense of a call from God, I will leave this land and I will go to another. And how to kind of have this Godward possibility brought to the fore as something to celebrate that from the individual deep experience of myself, I've been pushed into encounter with the other, and I know God better in this process. That can be a beautiful thing. And then my last category, um, tentatively titled the disenchanted, um, that I think we have to be able, as in any aspect of human life, in any consideration of religion, in any phenomenon that we talk about <coughs> religiously, the, the kind of the shadow side. And there would be an interesting category, it'd have to be thought about how to do this right, would be the, this, the occasions on which the interreligious encounter um, seems to be to my detriment, or, or stepping out to the other seems to have made me lose something without gaining something commensurate to go with it. Mm -hmm. Or in some way a great sense of regret, I went on this great journey out and I kind of stagger back home barely surviving. Because mm -hmm. I, I think there have to be occasions where uh, a Hindu-Muslim encounter or a Christian-Jewish encounter or a pagan Buddhist encounter, whatever these encounters are, that sometimes they don't work and people are not ready for them, people are confused by them, there's a kind of violence implicit in them, and I end up somehow injured or damaged by this. 
and that somehow to bring that into the conversation, lest we feel that we, we only celebrate the stories that are these great moments of, of recognition and joy, loss and gaining, but to say that in our conversations, even in this room, there's room for somebody to get up and say, I found that really hard, and I found that these journeys, I got lost, and I still haven't found my way back, and that that's okay too. But I think the, the stopping point for tonight is to say that the book has been wonderfully productive and I think opens up a whole new kind of era in how we think about interreligious realities today. I'm very grateful to Greg and to Jennifer and to um, Orr for putting this together. So thank you. Volunteer who's going to be. Volunteer, be. <laughs> so this really is your opportunity to ask questions or make comments, um, both uh, to the panel generally or to one or more of the particular panelists. So uh, let's see. Keep your eye <laughs> out. And, um, who, would, who has a, a question <coughs> or comment? Uh, thank you for this. The, uh, uh, the tenor of this whole discussion has, seems to me is one of tolerance and uh, the interfaith program, I'm not familiar with it, but it's the, from the book and from what you've said, there's a great deal of tolerance and interest in each other's uh, stories and faith. My question has to do, could you comment on how this might apply or the, uh, put in context with the more extreme religious fundamental approaches that seem to have a lot of influence in society but are not nearly as tolerant, whether it's the ultra-Orthodox Jewish, the uh, Islamist fundamentalists, the Christian fundamentalists, as we see in this country. And could you put that in some kind of context with the uh, interfaith tolerance that uh, is expressed in your book? I'll say one word and then I'll pass it yeah. to Ali Asani. Um, that's something I think a lot about. I grew up in an evangelical Christian uh, family and community, and I often felt like if this interfaith work doesn't speak to my folks, it's not going to have lasting power or impact in society. It's not the... I, I'm all for preaching to the choir because that feels really good, and I think that's important too, and we need to get louder, but there's a part of this work that has to be able to speak. And actually, later this month, I'll be out at Fuller Theological School speaking about this book. And Richard Mao, who's the president there, and I don't know if you know about Fuller as the largest evangelical sort of Christian seminary in the country, his essay, he has an essay in this book about um, Mormon Christian dialogue. And I think communities from all sorts of unexpected places are starting to realize whether they like it or not, differences exist, difference in belief, difference in practice. And just saying convert to my way is not good enough. And it's not um, endearing them to people beyond their community. So I, I have seen a growing openness, just speaking from my own experience with the evangelical community, um, to really thinking deeply in some new ways about what it means to uh, make peace with, in some sense, the reality of religious pluralism. And um, that's opening new possibilities. And again, I, I'll, I'll say that the relationship piece is so important. My father is the chair of evangelism at Fuller Theological Seminary. So the fact that his daughter is assistant professor of interfaith studies at Andover Newton Theological School has created a, you know, 40 odd year, I'm not gonna tell you how many year, dialogue between he and I about what that means for us to have these vantage points on our own religious commitments that are distinct. And we have a great dialogue and we've been talking about creating a book on we're, you know, from evangelism to interfaith, we're arguing about the preposition, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of possibilities in there that I think might surprise you. And I, I won't speak more broadly, but I think that's a great question and a good conversation to be asking about. Yeah, yeah and I want to add my particular essay in this book goes on to really talk about uh, 
the difficulties of intra-Muslim dialogue. Uh, when you have, uh, it really it confronts this issue of, um, you know, different Muslims sort of, and in a certain way how different Christians or different Jews and so on demonize each other and you become the other. And really raises up this question that, well, on the one hand, I claim, I write in this essay, and I'll just read it from that, you know, this intra-Muslim dialogue uh, does not exist in any meaningful way. You know, people recognize, okay, there's differences amongst Muslims, but there's no, there's no real meaningful dialogue uh, at, a, uh, at a grassroots level. Maybe there might be particular individuals, and that, um, and the reason I talk about the dialogue with one's nearest is emotionally fraught with many risks and fears. And so it's really, s it's trying to identify what the problems are uh, and then saying, okay, where do we go now? But f I think articulating those problems in the first place where there are issues where people have remained silent or, you know, they'll acknowledge that there are differences but they're not going to really engage with those differences. But what this essay actually starts saying towards the end of it, where we have to engage with these differences and we have to move forward, and it's a kind of a, just a challenge that the essay actually ends, ends with. So, so I would say it, these essays really do acknowledge the, the problems and the difficulties of uh, dealing with exclusivism within our own tradition. Yeah. I, the one piece I would add to the very wonderful comments that you've already heard about this, is this takes time. I mean, I think there has been a real thought that if, particularly on the more liberal side of the house, that if we just declared a different vision, everybody would see the marvelous enlightenment of that and just rush toward it. Um, I don't observe that happening, um, but I do think the enclosures that we create of thought are as dogmatic in liberal circles as they are in conservative ones. I think there are a whole lots of um, compartment doors that need to be opened. And while this next thing I say may seem very odd, um, the most troubling thing I know about the people who drowned on the Titanic, you've all seen Mr. Cameron's depiction of that boat in that wonderful film with Kate Winslet. Don't ask why I know about all this stuff, but it was one of those things I learned along the way. Those gates didn't exist. People stayed below deck and drowned because they knew their place. Now, we could talk about socioeconomic status, we can talk about racism, we can talk about homophobia or misogyny or any of the other plagues that have been visited on human existence. But very often in religious exclusionary dialogue and reinforcing name calling and demonization, to borrow your word, people don't have a door. They have no way to exit the place where they are. And there are no gates that are actually burying us from one another. It's one of the most amazing aspects of universities. People walk through the door thinking that what they've come for is something that we almost, Sharon Park said it years ago, wearing our hearts on our sleeve, we all want an education, as though that's something neutral. In case you haven't heard it before, it's extremely dangerous to get educated. It's extremely dangerous in a political sense, a religious sense, in every other way, because you're very likely to sit next to someone you're not supposed to and find that you like them a lot <laughs> and could even bring them home as a partner to be and cause all kinds of trouble. I think you're already taking me to. <laughs> but um, I, I just think these proposals happen all the time, and it's what my phone line burns up with as the chaplain of a university, <laughs> right? Um, but I think the, the questions that we don't find students asking of each other in the same way that our families and our traditions are invested in them and the ways they find commonalities. But I will take you to this marriage in 1983. I spoke first in that day. We did two sequential ceremonies. My wonderful groom's family wailed loudly through the whole first ceremony. It was very difficult to hear anything. My eight-month-old son was busy playing with the Pakistani children that had also come. I took some comfort in the fact that everybody was dressed for a wedding and it looked right. <laughs> we walked around afterward. I only learned later that my Muslim colleague would not have even been permitted in the state of New Hampshire to sign a marriage license. 
in a way that the state would have acknowledged. Many, many inequities are buried in these stories as these two wonderful folks meet. I'm pleased to tell you that the mom in this story um, concluded her life in Chicago living with her son and his wife and their children. Um, it was a happy ending, but it was not an easy one. And it was a journey of many miles and many forms. So I mean, I think we have to talk to ourselves about how much time this takes and the patience and the absent grammar and vocabulary and experiential story of lives coming together when in fact people don't know those stories until they start to tell them, which is why I think they're the curriculum. Can you uh, help us identify some of the mental qualities that would keep us from succeeding uh, at interfaith? And then, sort of, same qu same question for what will make a per what what makes a person agile and successful as an interfaith participant? I'll preface my uh, remarks by recommending a book to you called The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue by Catherine Cornell, And it seeks to identify various virtues that the author believes are crucial for meaningful interreligious encounter. I'll talk about one virtue that I feel is significant in this work, and it dovetails with what Janet just said, and that is humility. And um, I think that liberals and conservatives alike struggle with it. One way that I articulate it theologically is that on the one hand, if God, according to the Jewish mystical tradition that nurtures me daily, insists that God is Ein Sof, that God is without end or the infinite, then how is it ever possible for any of us to lay claim to absolute and full truth? On the other hand, says the same mystical tradition, God also makes herself known to us in a variety of ways, shapes, and forms, which is symbolized most powerfully by the Shekhinah, by God's indwelling presence in the world. And so how do we carry the tension between knowing and not knowing, between epistemological humility and a certain sense of deep insight and commitment? As Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, you know, faithfulness to moments of faith. And I think to me, like so much in life, holding that tension is very powerful. I'll give you one other textual example of it just because I think uh, it helps to illustrate the point. The authors in the book of the Zohar, the great medieval work of Jewish mysticism say, you look at the Bible and you see the word Elohim over and over again and you think you understand that term because in some sense it's the most generic term for God in the Hebrew Bible. But we recommend that you look at it again and deconstruct it. Look at it not as one word, but as two. And they're already picking up, of course, on the fact that Elohim could be read as a plural. So they say, read the word Elohim as me and Ele, as these or this and who, always holding that tension. Me means who, and Ele means this or these. So what does it mean in the eyes of the authors of the Zohar to live into a mature theological disposition it means that you're always carrying with you that sense of who or what or when and Eile, I am committed to these things quite deeply. And holding that, I think, to me is, is a part of the, of the great challenge of this work. And it's manifest, I think, in other, in other poles of experience. I'll stop there. Can I just add uh, one comment to that? I think would be Another way to think about it, and I think it's very complementary, would be that the very resources of the tradition to which we belong, if we belong to a tradition, are the same resources that can help us to be interreligiously open. Mm 
that it's not going to be a, a different persona or another character one has to pick up, but by trusting one's own tradition enough to say this tradition is enable will enable me to cross those boundaries. So you could, in a very simple ver example, uh, key to early Christian tradition and through the ages, faith, hope, and charity. And if you would think about what faith, hope, and charity call a community to and the individuals to, I think that can be, they can be incredibly useful and powerful in an interfaith context. I recently had occasion to, to talk about hope in that context, that hoping for the things of God really is a way of investing in the world in which we live and that God's promises have already come true around us. And therefore, being a Christian who has the theological virtue of hope enables one to be open. And, and it also can help to be still recognizable to the community from which you come. I might just add to that question of what, what constitutes succeeding mm -hmm. in interreligious dialogue. I'm not sure, but I think the, um, the virtue that I would underline would be the ability to listen. Because uh, it's not, I mean, one thing is to develop one's own voice, a personal voice, because there is a person on both sides of this uh, transaction that we describe as learning. And unless we know ourselves, it's going to be very hard to, to really engage with the, whatever it is we're engaged with. So that, that really is what education is about. Mm -hmm. But. Um, but the listening part of it is something that we've not always done so well. <laughs> and uh, really to hear the voice of the other, I think, is very significant. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for this rich discussion. I actually do use this book in a course I teach. I teach in, uh, an interfaith course. It's actually a Jewish Christian Muslim relations course. Uh, it's for undergraduates. A lot of the students are religion minors or majors, so they have they have some background. And we really, uh, one thing a story does is to engender more stories. And so what I do is I pair one of the stories in this book with a reading that talks to some of the theological or historical questions that that, that particular reading raises. Uh, but what happens sometimes, and this is where I like kind of your feedback and your expertise, is that students actually do share very uh, personal things. And on the one hand, it engenders rich conversations. And on the one hand, sometimes I leave the class wondering, uh, did, did other people either get offended or not take away the right impression? Or how, as the sort of moderator and the ones responsible for the learning, how can I ensure, I, I mean, on one level, it's a gut thing that you're doing the right thing and that these conversations are rich, but there's also this risk you know, when it's not just filling in the blanks with the correct vocabulary word or the correct date in history, it's a, it's uh, a risk. And so I wonder how you handle that as educators. There's an essay in this book. You shouldn't have a favorite, but I do, and it's not my own. Um, Mary Boyce writes a uh, narrative in this book about a teaching moment at Union Seminary, which is so like what you just described. And um, it's really been interesting at Brown. We have used bits and pieces of this book um, in discussions with faculty. We're trying to work on ideas about what, since no one disagrees with the idea that people should be religiously literate, that seems like safe ground to begin with, but no one agrees on what religious literacy is. So we've been trying to think about that together. And Mary's narrative is about a moment that happens in her classroom where she begins with a She's, uh, she's going to teach a class on stereotypes and the way they narrow the world and all these things that we just all agree with, right? And she has some uh, depictions from the Nazi era that she puts in front of the classroom. And what begins to unfold as people interact with them is first off, she sees with very much heightened clarity all of a sudden who's in her class. So she has Christian pastors who are black and white. She has Jewish theological students who are across the street from JTS um, who will soon be rabbis. And the conversation that begins to unfold really begins to tap into some of the continuing prejudice that lives in the world and the way people in the class are navigating that if they're candid with one another as clergy in the making or those in those communities, have they just been estranged each from the other, but then what is her role as the faculty member to create a space? Diana speaks of listening. I think 
um, Mary was really good at the listening part. I think she was stumped by the talking part um, as to what do I say to say, can we all just stay in this room together? So I clearly am doing what you don't need, which is I'm not answering your question. Um, I think the struggle, which has been in several of these comments and questions people have raised, is very real. And it strikes me that one of the things to do, one, is simply to comment that it exists, to call attention to the fact that there is real risk of injury in this conversation, and that we're reasonably sure as those teaching that that isn't the purpose of those who've come together to study. But in our awkwardness, and frankly, in the missing vocabulary, and the inadequate grammar, and the really, in, case, in some cases, limiting religious education we bring to the discussion, because we've never talked about these matters outside our own community. Um, I, I think those observations of simply saying these could be barriers, not that they are, but they could be, may help people to be a bit more patient with each other. We sometimes at Brown talk about can we extend to one another a presumption of goodwill, even if I've stuck my foot right on that part of you that hurts the most. Um, can you know that I didn't mean to do that? And will you tell me about it? It's, it's a beginning, but it is not an answer. Two brief pieces of uh, experience that may be helpful. One is that in various groups, both academic and non-academic, we've worked with students or participants on creating covenants for the class and using those as touchstones throughout the semester, the retreat, et cetera, and actually displaying them prominently so that if and when we forget, there is something to return to. And then, since I was quite esoteric in my last remark, <laughs> a very simple uh, method that I saw used at Hartford Seminary by my colleague, Yechaska Landau, um, is to give people permission to say, ouch and wow. <laughs> And it doesn't mean that the instructor or the participant needs to respond at length in that moment to something that's being said. You can, as he describes it, park it. But there's been some mechanism to at least <laughs> articulate something of that rawness. And then there is an agreement that people will come back to it and, and talk about it. Um, just to add one little point on top of those great reflections and suggestions, it's um, stories are powerful. I mean, that's sort of one of the takeaways from this evening, right? And they can be very raw. They can be very personal. I, I appreciated how you told your story, Janet. And I similarly, if I tell stories that matter to me, the emotion is still there. You feel, you inhabit the story as you give it to someone else. So. Being, understanding that dynamic, I think, is part of it. And it is not obvious or clear how you should use these stories. This goes back to Frank's curriculum question. Um, we need the collective data uh, from all of you to think about how to use these effectively. Or and I are experimenting with how to use them, and we've used them in many different ways. And I, I do think that one of the important things is to realize that it's not obvious and that you need to decide how you're using the stories, why you're using the stories, what you're hoping to invoke, what you're afraid you might invoke, and how to set some boundaries and parameters around the use of the story in this context for these purposes. So all those things that go into planning a particular lesson or a class, I think, are all the more important when you're taking something that is raw and like you said it's going to invite other stories so you need to be ready for that and just have a sense of of where where you might go you can imagine some of the possibilities Wh how are you going to respond so um thank you for the question it's a great question say a word there too I, where do you teach also Merrimack. at merrimack uh, that wonderful center that's good um one of the things that uh, that jenny and i did in the course this past summer was to spend a day with Marshall Gans at the Kennedy School, who teaches out of a personal narrative style. And so it becomes very clear that learning to speak in one's own voice a story that matters to us uh, is something we need to practice. This is not something that we just 
naturally do when we spill out everything that we think in one, uh, one fell swoop. We're never, we're, we're always more strategic than that. Mm -hmm. We need to think about what part of our story we tell and for what purpose. Um, it's not merely confessional. It's a way of thinking um, from uh, a standpoint of articulating one's own voice. And that is so important for us in the educational enterprise. It's not just sort of uh, spilling one's guts, so to speak. And so one of the things that Marshall does is to invite us to try telling a story that matters to us and then getting some reflection from our colleagues in a small group uh, about it. And th that's a discipline that we rarely <laughs> engage in, but he's very, very good at. And I know a number of students in uh, Harvard Divinity School take his uh, semester-long course on personal narrative just to become more proficient at that. I mean, what I wonder is there are differences in almost every disciplines, like in physics and math and, uh, and all aspects of lives and worldviews. Why is it largely religion where differences are not so reconcilable? Like, I've never heard of interphysicist dialogue <laughs> <laughs> or intermusicians dialogue. And actually, on one hand, you know, we as human beings like diversity, like, you know, this cultural diversity or biodiversity. We, we want to save a species, species which is being endangered. We really strive to save them. So what is the root cause of the diversity, I mean, in religions, like animosity or, you know, which makes it largely not, you know, reconciling? So if we go to the root cause, perhaps, you know, we can find a solution that's a strong solution to really come to this interfaith stuff. Your question's enormous, and um, just it's it's really an honor in a way to think that we've evoked such big thoughts in this room. Um, first off, I, I, I'm going to just um, challenge a little bit. And so I teach in the medical school at Brown, and I can't think of a place that's more contentious um, about uh, the practice of medicine and how we should or shouldn't treat people. And um, oddly enough, one of the reasons I continue to do that piece is because I feel like it's... Uh, the, the health and well-being of our fellow and sister humans feels to me almost as close as I'm ever going to get um, to a discussion about God. Um, if it has to do with whether you're going to live or die, that's pretty important. If it has to do with God, it's pretty important. Um, and that may strike everybody as an odd um, synergy, but it's useful to me in my thinking and, and my work. Um, but I do think the Academy has, um, to borrow Diana's image from just a minute ago, Marshall has been especially good at teaching us about stories and their strategic telling. Um, the Academy, in its disciplines, it seems to me, has developed a very um, sophisticated and layered way of speaking about stuff. And we get good in our disciplines in learning how to do that, so that it might be hard for somebody sitting in an audience to know that uh, we're fighting. Um, we might sound very polite, um, even when we're taking each other apart at the ankle. So um, I think that what might be true, or a place where I can really um, uh, feel a resonance with what you're asking, is that I think the consequences of disagreeing religiously may matter so much more deeply if I think that literally eternity is pivoting on this and whether or not uh, the world is going in the right direction. And that's a moral issue, it's an ethical issue, it's a question of the goodness of what it is to be alive. So I think sometimes the questions are so large because they're tied in most of our traditions to deep understandings of who and what God is and therefore who and what am I and how am I related to all that. Where if it's physics that might not be quite that cosmic, but I hesitate to say that because I think, such as I can understand physics, I do hear sort of cosmic discussions going on in that. It's just a different idiom. And not likely to prompt, well, I won't say that. I was gonna say a word. <laughs> um, I would actually also um, add to this is that from my perspective, 
uh, difference is intrinsic to being human. All aspects of human life are marked by difference. And you can talk about, you know, you're talking about disciplinary difference, but, you know, your racial difference, your ethnic difference, your cultural difference, linguistic difference. There's, we are surrounded by difference. And uh, it's not just religious difference, right? Uh, I think we tend to zero in on religion because that seems, oh, you know, religion is something dangerous and it creates wars. But I think part of that is people are illiterate about the nature of religion because religion is embedded in all these differences, political, economic, social, and so on. Religion, people tend to think religion um, uh, uh, as if it operates in a vacuum, and it doesn't. So some of it is this perception that it's about religion. It's very often not about religion. People invoke religious symbols and ideas and so on, but the underlying motivating factors are lying elsewhere. And I would say that in our present time, uh, if you're talking about ideologies that create, that are dangerous, that are great, I would say nationalism mm -hmm. is a very, very dangerous ideology because it's premised on the notion of the other and in a certain way triumphing, o triumphing over the other. And so if you look at the history of the 20th century, look at all the world wars and so on, what's it all about? It's nationalism. If you look at what's going on today in many parts of the world, right? It's conflicting nationalisms and patriotisms and mm -hmm. so on. So we have to really think about, you know, how these ideologies of difference that are constructed, it's far beyond religion. You know what you say, theology, right? So it's, it's, it's I think it's, uh, uh, it permeates the human condition. I agree with much of what has already been said, and I would just add, and this ties back to your question about values or virtues, that self-criticism is necessary, and that we need to look into our religious texts, rituals, traditions, and using Rakur again as, uh, as a mentor for language, right? Discordance and concordance. Um, where are the models for people engaging in serious, in consequential religious conversation, but doing so in responsible ways. Can we identify those, lift those up? And do we have the courage and honesty also to look into our traditions and to see the times and places where people have failed to do that? And how those messages, how those texts, how those rituals perpetuate certain kinds of attitudes and behaviors. And so I think we need to be careful in sifting and sorting and, and clarifying and trying to continually to develop, you know, an ethos of religious pluralism. And as Diana says quite beautifully in a number of places, it doesn't mean that we leave our commitments behind. We bring them to the table knowing that we're going to continue to disagree. But can we be, to use a Jewish expression, in a chavruta relationship, if you will, where we're talking about issues that really matter and figure out a way how to live together. Um, and that, I think, has been underdeveloped, frankly, in many of our religious traditions when it comes to the religious other. There are resources, but I think we have more work to do. Softball? Okay. Right. Here, here comes the softball. <laughs> uh, some organizations out there are attempting to do interfaith work, such as social service, uh, before they've really done a lot of um, interfaith dialogue, uh, which may be putting the cart before the horse in some ways. But since this is already happening, um, is there a way, if that interfaith work is taking place to integrate narrative during it afterwards in a, in a way to help the, um, the success of that endeavor? 
Yeah, well, so there's <laughs> there are some nonprofits out there um, who are uh, attempting to bring people of various uh, religious traditions together to uh, to build things, to create social justice, uh, and maybe some of the religious leaders from congregations have had interfaith dialogue, but the participants themselves from the communities have not really done that. And so they find themselves thrown into a situation with the religious other, uh, and, and there's a lot of um, you know, ignorance about the other traditions. How, how can you integrate the, um, the conversations, the narratives um, into that kind of action if the action is already taking place? I haven't done it, but I have something to say. Uh, um, one would be on, on uh, uh, regarding interreligious dialogue. I think it, we have to understand historically, I think it's modeled on ecumenical dialogue mm -hmm. and the problems among Christian denominations of talking to one another. And that presumes a long history of common creeds, common sacraments, common elements in which it makes sense to say, with all of that in common, we have to find a way to talk to each other. It can be misleading to say the first thing I should do with somebody of a very different religious tradition is sit down and have a dialogue. And that the, the, the substance of working together for some time, becoming friends, collaborating, can be a wonderful way to proceed. And I would just add that um, one of the groups I would think of that's not particularly interreligious but has done wonderful work in service is the Catholic worker movement in this country. And the Catholic worker movement in the newspaper that still comes out, it's still a penny. Uh, one of the powerful things about it is this kind of intense long-term work in nonviolence, dealing with poverty, is individuals telling their stories about how they became involved in this and how originally they knew Dorothy Day or Peter Morin or in later generations had lived out certain relations. And I think that kind of model from the work, from the cooperation to the storytelling creates a possibility where maybe a generation later, the dialogue can be much more powerful. I was just gonna tell you a story, of course. Um, we have been, we're now in the third year of uh, teaching a co-curricular course um, that bridges religious studies faculty with chaplains. Um, it's a course in religious literacy, and one of our students really deserves a lot of credit for taking ideas that have been burning around in several of our heads and turning them into a reality. At the end of the course, we do what you always do, right? You have to fill out an evaluation. So we ask students what they got out of this course. People say all kinds of things, but one of the students um, said, you know, I came to this course as a Jewish man, and I was raised in a family where I was bar mitzvahed and we really did a fair amount of Judaism. He said, the thing I came out of this course realizing is I don't know any Judaism. Um, and it was really a, a, a comment, I think, about what many of the students felt. They had come together to become better acquainted with each other's traditions and discovered that their own education was quite lacking. And that maybe isn't the full direction of your um, inquiry, but I do think that actually one of the things that this movement in many different faces and forms and organizations and community manifestations has done is to draw people back to learning about their own traditions, but with a sense of neighborliness, which I think is very different um, than my learning it over against you. I'm now learning it because next to you I see that you're learning too and we can keep talking over tea or books or whatever. And I think that is really truly the reassurance that many people need because they fear that if there's a passion and a development in the direction of an interfaith movement, maybe this will be away from particularity and there won't be any specific identities that people will have anymore and it will all be mush. Um, I think that that's not really what we've seen and I really do see students learning more of their own traditions and saying, I love doing this house building together but now I realize I want to know more about what my tradition teaches me about why I need to continue to do that. Um, there's so many good ways we could take the conversation. I just, I'll add a few things. Um, the question that sort of underlies your question for me is what is interfaith work? Why are we doing it? What's the goal here? And I think there are many different legitimate goals and that it's very helpful to sort some of those out. And interfaith or interreligious dialogue might be the right vehicle or model for a particular set of goals and not for another set of goals. There's so many ways into the work, and one thing I do love about the book is that if you read these 53, and Joan has a story in the foreword, so 54 stories, 
um, you could probably parse out a good number of different definitions about what interfaith even means. And I think that's important to keep in mind that we are still all not using the same words in the same ways. This, this vocabulary is emerging. And um, the question about where you start is one that really interests Or and I and the work we do with Circle. Y you know, do you start with the book learning because you've got to at least know the five pillars of Islam if you're going to, or do you start with the, uh, you know, the classroom experience? Do you start with doing a project together? And I guess where we've probably landed is that you start with relationship building. Because if I know Janet, then when she says something to me, or when she answers a question or asks a question, I'm going to hear that in a whole different way because I have a concern for her and for our relationship. And we have the luxury of doing that at Andover Newton and Hebrew College because we share these campuses and some of our students are there for far more years than the program would suggest that they be there. But, um, we have a chance over time, so it's sort of an optimal situation, but given that we have that resource, we take advantage of it by really saying our number one goal is to build lasting relationships across religious difference for its own sake. Out of that emerges all sorts of remarkable things, all sorts of new questions, all sorts of new answers, all sorts of new ideas about what this work is for and about. So. Um, I wouldn't limit anybody's sense of what interfaith work is or should be, but I would say if you think you know what it is, um, read some more stories. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to call this uh, to a conclusion.